Okay, so Dave has kind of introduced some general agriculture principles. The question is, how different is organic agriculture? What are those things that might lead to very different outcomes, uh, positive or negative, from organic system? So here's a list of some of the things that are clearly uh, different in organic uh, agriculture. Typically, we will see more organic amendments being brought into the system, whether it is uh, compost or growing more green manures that are specifically uh, put back into the soil, perhaps more cover crops. We don't have we do have more diversity in the rotation, and this changes perhaps the nature of the, the residues, the carbon going back into the system. We don't have synthetic nitrogen, and so we do eliminate one of the, the main uh, sources of greenhouse gases, but obviously we do other things for nitrogen, and a big question is what's the, the net uh, balance on that. But typically most organic systems from the research end up with lower levels of soluble nitrogen in the soil, and this does reduce the risk of N2O emissions. Most of our livestock are going to be pasture-based, and so a big question there is how does that come out on the greenhouse gases? So there's probably still emissions from the pasture, but uh, um, a lot to be done in terms of trying to calculate the overall influence of some of these changes. Organic systems often do have some more tillage, and we know tillage is not something uh, we want a lot of for, uh, in terms of controlling our emissions. Sometimes there are lower yields, and therefore if you're putting your emissions on a per land area basis versus a per unit of output basis, this factor can change how organic systems look. And often because of the, the, the lack of the synthetic and organic systems have a quite a bit lower energy input because there's an energy charge put on that synthetic fertilizer that's not present in organic systems. But you start to look at the studies that are out there, and it's, as was mentioned earlier by Alice, that farms are incredibly diverse. And so trying to extrapolate a result from an irrigated uh, farm in California to a, a rain-fed farm in Minnesota, we need to be really careful about doing that because often these results are quite site-specific, environment-specific, and practice-specific. Let's take a look at the different gases then in, in terms of what organic farming might be doing. So with carbon dioxide, uh, we do most likely have more organic inputs. One of the clear goals is to maintain or improve soil quality, and we do that by uh, beefing up our inputs of organic materials through manures, compost, cover crops, green manures, etc. And typically we do see both from the research and from grower experience that soil carbon uh, will be increasing in a lot of these systems. So we are adding to that stored carbon, which is certainly a, a benefit from a greenhouse gas standpoint as well as the other benefits that they've mentioned. One of the questions is how much C is retained in the soil, and, and Dave discussed those factors that that help uh, retain as well as emit C, and there, there's a question as to whether organic systems are fundamentally different, and I think this is an area where we need to learn a lot more. There's some evidence that the soil biota, the soil biology, may work slightly differently in an organic system, and we don't really know how widespread, consistent that is, and, and does it lead to a meaningful increase in uh, soil carbon storage. Since there is often more tillage that does uh, put us at a little bit more risk of, of emitting CO2 or storing less CO2 in the soil. And of course, more tillage burns more diesel fuel typically, so you've got that impact. And then the lower energy footprint, because of the lack of synthetic end, can often be tra translated into carbon dioxide uh, emissions. Here's some results put together by Marriott and Wander several years ago, where they looked at a number of existing published uh, data on long-term side-by-side comparisons of organic and conventional. In this case, they found nine sites where they had the side-by-side -side comparison for at least 10 years, and they were mostly in temperate, humid conditions. The only exception was California. All of them were annual crop-based. All of them had tillage, so they were kind of the worst-case scenario for trying to store and build soil carbon. Yet, over all these different studies, Soil organic carbon increased 14% over that 10-year period. And at the same time, they were measuring the, the more active fraction of carbon, the particulate organic matter carbon. That increased 30 to 40% over that same time period. Whether it was legume-based or manure-based organic, they saw pretty much the same result, as you can see here. Both of those systems had significantly more soil carbon than a conventional system 
under the most difficult types of situations to build soil carbon. So that's very encouraging to see those sorts of results that organic systems can perform at that level across a number of locations and over time. As far as uh, another CO2 impact, as I mentioned, was the whole energy situation. And here's a breakdown of looking at the energy budgets of a conventional versus organic corn production in the USA. And there are a number of these budgets that are out there now to look at. What you'll typically see is the biggest difference is almost always the conventional has a very big energy footprint for the nitrogen fertilizer that the organic clearly does not have. In this case, they have put an energy credit in for growing uh, the vetch, that's the green manure, their nitrogen source, and, and there may be some other factors that are added back in there. But typically, the nitrogen is a, is a big input that uh, makes the conventional systems more energy intensive with its um, associated CO2 footprint. Nitrous oxide, as we've mentioned, is, is really the big one to look at in agriculture. So in organic agriculture, we're using organic nitrogen sources, and we know there are some direct emissions from compost, from manure, from green manure. How big are they? I don't think we've got a full handle on that and what kind of variation there is across farming system, uh, environment, etc. But another thing to think about is if you're hauling in manure, Oftentimes, it's coming from a conventional farm, livestock raised on a conventional farm, because it's not required that we use organically manure from organic animals in the U.S. And so that animal probably was fed on crops raised on synthetic nitrogen at some point, some point, and therefore it probably has an embedded synthetic nitrogen footprint in there somewhere. The big question is, how do you credit this? And that's where the whole concept of life cycle assessment comes in, where you try to allocate the, these different impacts and see what it does to your final conclusion. Organic systems do tend to have lower soluble N in the soil in general, but our organic fertilizers are extended release. They don't give a shot of soluble N and then they're gone, but they may be releasing N uh, during times of the year when the crop is not taking it up, and then we have some risk of elevated soil and at those times of year. So that's something that we need to look at as well. Uh, putting in practices such as cover crops to try to, to counteract that is clearly one of the things that a lot of organic growers do. Another aspect, as we're increasing organic matter in our soils, it tends to change the soils in, in ways favorable to reducing nitrous oxide emissions. So organic matter tends to increase water holding capacity and that then should lessen the amount of time that your soil is in a more saturated condition where your nitrous oxide emissions are more likely. And by reducing compaction potential, maintaining soil structure, similarly it's going to reduce nitrous oxide. So that's another kind of indirect effect that organic systems may be having on nitrous oxide emissions. I did uh, find this one study done in Italy, specifically taking a look at the impact of compost and green manure in comparison to uh, a urea fertilizer and an unfertilized check, taking a look at nitrous oxide emissions, which is what's on the axis over here. And not uh, surprising, when we have a big flush of nitrogen from that green manure, it's not all that different from the fertilizer spike that went on as well. And we can see that the compost is very low throughout the season here. And then we move from the spring, which was a more wet season, more of these, these fertilizer inputs being put in into the summer, drier season. Nothing is emitting at all. So that reemphasizes the importance of looking at some of these fluxes at different times of the year, at different points before and after key management uh, practices that might influence the nitrogen regime. So this suggests that uh, green manures may have a N2O footprint that we need to look at a little more and uh, take a look at how we might reduce it. Compost is another difficult one. Where are we doing the, the, the measurements and, and crediting of greenhouse gas emissions? And There's three basic aspects we can look at. One is the feedstock itself that's going into the compost. Second would be the compost production, whether it's a turned windrow or a static pile or in vessel, et cetera. And then ultimately the compost has some sort of end use that may have a, a greenhouse gas footprint. So in this example, I, I drew from a study in Canada where they actually measured the emissions from compost piles using cattle manure and straw. And based on one metric ton of dry matter, that was their starting point of the feedstocks of the manure and straw, over the composting period, they had about 200 kilograms of CO2 carbon equivalents in this case, 
uh, per metric ton of that initial material. So that was the emissions. In addition, there was a carbon dioxide emission that I haven't included, but that's considered more or less carbon neutral. These are the emissions we're concerned about from compost. At the same time, that finished product had carbon in it that was going to go to the soil, and a certain portion of that would end up as stable carbon in the soil. So of the 200-some kilos of carbon in the finished compost, estimating about 50% to be stable carbon, we see about 100 kilograms of CO2 carbon equivalents for the, per metric ton of the initial material doesn't offset the emissions of composting that material. So just an initial tried, uh, attempt to, to calculate this. Uh, I've seen various attempts to do this where the raw materials would have gone to a landfill instead, and then they can credit uh, a methane emission that would have occurred in the landfill. And uh, that overwhelms any of the emissions from the actual composting process. So there's a lot of accounting that goes on in terms of trying to understand compost. But I guess my take home is that uh, we need to, to try to look at this more and come up with some protocols for assessing compost and greenhouse gases. There are quite a few studies now trying to look at systems of production and how greenhouse gases do over time in organic management versus other types of management. Here's one that specifically looked at beef production. This was in Ireland. They had a conventional, they had an agri-environmental scheme with some best management practices incorporated, and then an organic scheme. And you can see on a live weight basis, there was not a huge difference in emissions compared to a pretty substantial difference when we put it on a per area uh, per, of land basis. So that's a big factor when you're starting to look at some of the reported research. Here's a study from Michigan over 10 years. In this case, they compared several agricultural systems, conventional tillage, no-till, organic, straight alfalfa, and then they had a number of uh, systems letting the, the fields return to their native forest. And they looked at carbon, nitrogen, liming in this case even was included, fuel use for equipment, nitrous oxide emission, methane, degradation, and then they came up with the net of all these factors for the net global warming potential in terms of carbon dioxide equivalents, kilograms per hectare per year. So they were actually measuring the emissions out in the field in chambers and checking this uh, over the year and over the 10-year period. So the, the conventional tillage system did have the highest emission. We went to no-till. We were able to re reduce it by about 90%. Go to organic, we didn't do quite as well as in the tilled system. Alfalfa was actually the negative number. So all these are positive, which means they're still net emitters, whereas the alfalfa was in a net sequestration of greenhouse gases. But that was a tenth of what was happening with the early uh, forest development when they were just letting it return to the, the native state. And I guess in, in some of our ecosystems, we're just it's going to be very difficult to get to this sort of a level and maintain a food production, production system that gives us the kinds of crop and livestock outputs that we need. So to expect a zero emission, I think in many cases, it, it's going to be a stretch. We're probably going to have some emissions. Question is how much can we push them down towards zero? Here's another study from California. In this case, these are modeled results based on some field trials. And their results are a, a bit different than what was seen in Michigan, which does point out some of the regional differences. So in this case, they did not see a big benefit of going from conventional to conservation tillage. But their conservation tillage was probably still more passes in the field than what the conventional tillage might have been in Michigan. So uh, these, these terms, you need to really look at what they're defining to get a sense of what uh, the implication would mean for greenhouse gases. When they went from these systems and added the cover crop, they got down towards a zero emission. So cover crops were quite potent in terms of mitigating gases. And then when they added manure, this was in one of the organic systems, they got a big uh, overall net sequestrations from the yearly additions of the manure. And I think this was somewhere in the realm of five metric tons of manure per hectare per year gave them this kind of a, a rate, which is not a huge amount of manure addition. So overall, conservation tillage had a modest effect, cover crop was a bigger effect, and then manure in this study was a much bigger effect.